Welcome to Encouraging Wellness, where we shed light on the plethora of holistic healing and wellness methods so you can give yourself the power to ask why and become bigger than the condition you are dealing with or the illness you are currently fighting. Join Pamela Wirth as she sits down with doctors, medical experts, healthcare practitioners, and those with unique healing stories to dissect groundbreaking practices that combine traditional Western medicine with alternative modalities. Hear conversations that empower you to go beyond hurtful stigmas, outdated practices, and unnecessary labels, guiding you towards a healthier and happier you. Here, we highlight your true worth and help unleash your inner courage. Now your host, Pamela. Hi, this is Pamela with Hello Health and the Encouraging Wellness Podcast. And today I have Jimmy St. Louis. Jimmy is uh, so many things, including a prior professional athlete, an Olympian, entrepreneur, businessman focused on innovating and changing health and technology industries. Uh, He's currently focused on innovating and advancing the industry of financing through a combination of technology advancements, as well as a new operational and uh, team efficiencies. Prior uh, founder and CEO of Regenerative Medicine Solutions, a leading medical company with a focus on cellular therapy and a mission to treat the untreatable. Um, Under RMS, Jimmy founded the Lung Health Institute and the Cognitive Health Institute and uh, was very successful and is more recently the CEO and founder of Ali RX. Uh, Jimmy's business career includes five years um, with the Laser Spine Institute, uh, grew it from nine people to over a thousand, and has a passion for advancements in medicine, um, including regenerative and cellular health and wellness. So as an early adopter of new procedures, medical treatments, and overall health, Jimmy is a longtime advocate of life dedicated to wellness. So Jimmy, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, this is Pamela with Hello Health and the Encouraging Wellness Podcast. And today I have Jimmy St. Louis. Jimmy is an entrepreneur, competitive athlete, businessman focused on innovating and changing health and technology industries, previous professional athlete, and uh, founder and CEO of Regenerative Medicine Solutions, a leading medical company with a focus on cellular therapy and a mission to treat the untreatable. Uh, Jimmy also funded the Lung Health Institute and Cognitive Health Institute and uh, has many, many years of experience in health and wellness and is currently COO and founder or CEO and founder of AliRx. and look forward to uh, Jimmy, please tell us a little bit more about you and all the things you're working on. Uh, it's really near and dear to my heart in terms of how we get to the root of the health, of the health and wellness crisis we're in. Yeah, great. Thanks, Pamela, for having me and uh, have looked forward to being on the show and have have heard a number of your other podcasts and um I nice to me to be in good company here uh with you and other guests as well. So thanks for having me. Um you know really I think our passions are really aligned with what you're doing with Hello Health and what we're starting to launch with with Ali RX. Um you know we really believe that uh, a lot of what happens from a health perspective starts in your gut. And throughout my experience in healthcare, that's always been something that I believed I have never really figured out how to kind of operationalize that for, for patients. And um, as we talk more, be happy to go more into it, um, but have been a lifelong learner. Um, I'm not a physician, but I've been in healthcare now for gosh, uh, about 18 years and have had a number of, of startups that we think have just helped a lot of people. Um, I really believe in trying to solve problems for people and, you know, let's identify something that's that's a real need. And if they're, if the mainstream way in taking care or treating that need may no longer be acceptable, or perhaps people are you know, yearning for something more, uh, we try to create protocols, companies, or programs to find a way to, to ultimately give them a better solution and ultimately a happier life where perhaps their length of life can meet their quality of life. No, that's super. So, um, this this latest endeavor uh, is is fantastic, and I've been looking high and low um, for affordable solutions for people for a long time. Um, I've certainly come across plenty of unaffordable solutions, but you know, as we take a look at gut health, as well as um, your nutrition, your genetics, um, your vitamin levels, any deficiencies, um, any challenges that someone might be having, tell us a little bit about some of the testing that that you're launching and doing and, um, and some of the, the great 
um, sort of next steps people can anticipate and do. Sure. Well, you know, I think that the science has been out there for for quite some time. Um, the challenge is that it, it, these this type of science is not in particular taught in medical school, certainly. Um, and then, you know, post-medical school and the residency, most likely not. Uh, and so you really have to go and seek that out as, as a medical provider. Um, <clears throat> and I think that what really takes place here is um, you've got a number of, like, you've got philosophy in healthcare that's really focused around treating a particular ailment. And look, okay, let's, let's go in, let's see what the symptoms are. Let's try to find a way to treat those symptoms. Um, you hear a lot of the time people talk about underlying conditions and, okay, so there, there's kind of these underlying conditions, um, and what are the best ways to, to intercept that? Well, our current healthcare system is not focused on intercepting, uh, problems before they really start to happen. It's again, focused on treating those particular ailments or symptoms. So our perspective is the large amount of things that happen within your body starts within your gut and in your gut you, know, you have bacteria as you've got bacterial makeup you've got good bacteria bad bacteria at some point in time if there is an imbalance um, that's causes what you know, people are more more commonly understanding as leaky gut syndrome and when that takes place that causes your body to be under attack you know the, the i, I kind of look at it like if you are not getting rest and you don't have a good diet and you wake up feeling lethargic um that's because your body has been kind of under the um been really like under a, a fist fight all night right it's, it's not giving it, itself the proper chance to rest and recover so what takes place in the gut causes that leaky gut syndrome that causes inflammation that's your body fighting against itself not working for itself and when that starts to happen you can develop all kinds of symptoms associated with autoimmune diseases there's even a strong correlation of neurodegenerative diseases being correlated to, to gut health um, as your body develops a, a you know, systemic inflammation. That inflammation over time can begin to beat up against and permeate the blood-brain barrier, causing you know, a variety of issues, um, one of which is, is Alzheimer's. Um, and they're really, a lot of people are referring to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes now. And, happy later on here in the conversation and go into that. But ultimately that's our philosophy is, you know, you've got, it all starts there with, with gut health. So how do you improve gut health? So from our perspective, you improve gut health by improving what goes into your body. But I think that there's a, another peel back of the onion here where we believe that generally certain foods are healthy for us. You know, you may hear, spinach or goji berries or cashews or macadamia nuts and you know and all these things but there's oftentimes there's one there's conflicting opinions and then two on top of that if something's good for you it may not be good for me you know your body may not respond well to spinach and mine might, might respond very well to spinach so what we actually do is we do that that gut health testing and food sensitivity testing to tell people exactly what's right for them. And then we put that into a food prescription for them. Uh, so that food prescription is recipes. I um, mean, it says, okay, here's what's good for you. Here's what's not good for them. Um, and then we'll take it further and start to show people at restaurants what they can eat and give them access to um, things on DoorDash that, that sh they should eat and things they should not eat. But ultimately that's our philosophy here is, it starts with the gut and we want to utilize food as medicine to help, um, you know, to help heal your gut and give you just a healthier life. No, I think that's great. And so when, when people take the test, what sort of, um, A, what kind of test is it? Is this like a blood, saliva, stool? Um, and then what sort of results are, are people finding? And then kind of what, what the next steps are? Sure. Yeah. So someone goes online, they, they order the package and it gets sent to them, uh, depending on what they order, you know, kind of like the, the package that we would most recommend comes with two health test kits, along with some probiotics and prebiotics that have been provided by you at, you know, at the low health. Um, and then we, um, we also provide them with a guide and a, um, a journal and, the guide is is a book that kind of goes into our philosophy in more detail, as I just described, and then it gives them kind of some baseline recipes and things that may be good for them while they're waiting on their test results. So it's kind of like a um, prime them for for what's really to come. 
So there's two different levels of tests. Uh, the one that's primarily utilized is just a simple finger prick. Um, it's a pretty expansive panel though. So you get a finger prick and um, you, pr you provide your blood on kind of three different little things that look like Q-tips. And we provide a very detailed assessment of food allergy response and um, an inflammatory response uh, as it relates to hundreds, if not thousands of different types of foods. Uh, there also is a gut health test kit as well. That's kind of an, an add-on option as well. And that, that gut health test kit really tells you, has your microbiome performing for you? Um, but most likely what takes place on that gut health test kit from a, a food and ingredient perspective is going to be very similar to what we are recommending on your food allergy um, and inflammatory response tests as well. So you log in your patient portal or customer portal, you get a report that shows you all the do's and don'ts from a food perspective. So on the left column, you might see 150 different ingredients that are great for you. The middle column, you'll see some things that we would recommend that you rotate. And that last column of stuff that you should stay away from. We take anything you should rotate and anything you should stay away from, and we eliminate it from um, from your food prescription. So anything that has those ingredients in them, it, those are then those recipes are eliminated. And then we'll provide you specifically with a food prescription based exactly on what you should put into your uh, you know into your mouth and eat. And then we recommend that you retest every six months and you'll start to see some of your results change. Maybe even some foods that you loved that you couldn't eat, you can cycle back in. Um, so we, we recommend that people really stay on a good cadence of this testing so we can continue to be more and more precise uh, for their, you know, for what they should be eating. And how long does it take to get the results back typically? Yeah, so uh, typically it takes longer for someone to, to see the test, read the instructions and take it than it does for them to get the results. Um, you know, we, we we guarantee two weeks. Typically people are getting the results back in about a week. Um, and those results come in, then it takes us, you know, a few days to provide the food prescription, but you'll get a ding to your inbox saying results are ready. You can go in there and start to review them. Um, that's how you can start to develop your shopping list. And then once those results come in and we provide you with your food prescription, you can swap the recipes in and out. And on your member portal, it actually will provide you with um, a shopping list for the week. So if you want to go out and shop based upon all those different recipes that you like, um, or that you have for the week, you get your shopping list, you can go out and you know get ready for the week. We also see a lot of people just take the ingredients that they can't have and they make their own recipes. You know, they may go out and buy all those ingredients and now they know exactly what they should put into their body and they may go, they may go and make their own uh, recipes off of those as well. No, oh, that's cool. And do you find that this changes depending on the age or if it's a male, female, or, you know, is there a difference between like children or teenagers or aging adults or um, later in life? Do you, is there any differences that t typically come up or any patterns or anything that? Happens? Yeah. Yeah. We, I'd say we, we don't have enough data yet for us to be able to, to be conclusive from that perspective. Of course, part of this program is um, allows people to still put in their preferences. So of course, those preferences are going to change, especially from kids to adults. Um, you know, for example, let's say asparagus is on your quote unquote superfood list, but you don't like asparagus, you go in and you eliminate that uh, from your, you know, from your list and anything that has that in it, it will not be recommended to you uh, as well. So but not enough evidence just yet to be able to show a difference based upon, you know, those demographics that you listed, but I'm sure we'll start to notice some down the road. And that's something we do plan on doing once we have enough data, we'll start to provide some, some research papers based upon our specific findings uh, as well. No, that's super. And, you know, in your experience, you've done quite a bit of, you know, just kind of change subjects for a second, stem cells. And, you know, you were a professional football player, obviously you've seen and lived, you know, a lot of wear and tear on your body and certain things. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned over the years and what's kind of led you here? Sure. Um, so, you know, as it relates to the world of regenerative medicine, um, I really try to keep, keep it very simple and explain to people that the field of regenerative medicine is really geared towards finding the best way to accelerate the healing process for, for your body. Um, one great example might be um, as you get older, um, you might notice that a cut on your leg takes longer to heal than when you were younger. 
really what that is, is it's not even just less stem cells, but what it is, is those signaling agents are not as strong either. So when you say get a localized stem cell injection, say in, in your knee, it's not necessarily just those stem cells that go into your knee that are actually are starting to heal it. What's taking place is those it's signaling. It's it's calling the the troops in to say, hey, why don't we start to go in and attack this problem? Let's let's heal it together. So it really serves as as a signaling agent. Um, typically, what happens when you get say a localized stem cell injection? I've had several. I've I've, I've had three ACL tears, uh, so I've had several directly in my knee. Um, you'll notice a couple days of pain. Um, it's a little more painful than, than maybe expected. That's actually a good thing. That's inflammation. That's that localized inflammation, not chronic, um, you know, not, not systemic, but it's just, it's happening in a localized spot. Those are the signaling agents working. And when that takes place, um, you know, that the healing process has begun. Eventually that inflammation starts to subside. And then that's when, um, your body has a chance to start to regenerate perhaps some of that tissue that that may have been torn or damaged uh, from before. The other thing that we've noticed is you know, different than, say, those localized injections with, say, cellular therapy. Um, and for purposes of this particular question, I'll stay away from the difference of PRP and stem cell and exosomes and all the discussions taking place there, and we'll call it regenerative medicine. Uh, we noticed that the main thing it really does is it helps to reduce inflammation. Um, so when we were treating patients, lung disorders, for example, we weren't providing stem cells to go in and heal the lungs. We were really effective at just reducing their body's inflammation, which then allowed it to start to work for itself. And we would see an improvement in pulmonary function because the lungs had less inflammation and therefore their pulmonary function actually started to improve. Um, and if that happens, then perhaps the lung has the opportunity to start to heal itself, but that's really just your body beginning to work for itself. Yeah. Super interesting. And, and I, based on some of the research I've done as well as with, um, my mother, she's been getting some stem cell treatments and natural cancer killing cells with her cancer, uh, in the lungs, for instance, I would imagine a lot of that was through IV, not necessarily an injection. Is that fair to say? Right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of funny how we stumbled on that protocol, yeah. actually. Um, so go online, you do some research and maybe you type in, you know, stem cell treatment for, um, say, post heart attack victims or stem cell treatment for healing the heart or something. Um, you will see a lot of discussion about how to, uh, about the challenge of stem cells getting treated through an IV passing through your circulatory system. And then a large percentage of the stem cells don't even make it to the heart. So we utilize common sense to develop our treatment protocols for, for the lung. Um, so actually what we notice is in these studies, these physicians and scientists were complaining about the stem cells getting caught in the lungs and not making it to the heart. So common sense says, well, perhaps we should find a way to treat the lungs. Right? Yeah. So the protocol was was very simple, um, and uh, we, we call it, it was more cellular therapy because although we would re-administer something that's called the Buffy coat, which had a concentration of stem cells, um, it was a combination of the stem cells and then uh, PRP uh, combined together. Um, but we still did, uh, we still did um, bone marrow aspiration, as well as um, adipose tissue, which of course has a high concentration of stem cells. But the protocol was easy. We would essentially concentrate the cells and we would re-administer it through an IV. Um, and then we actually trademark the term, the pulmonary trap, because uh, there's a medical term called the pulmonary track, which is where the cells pass through. But since those cells got stuck in the lungs, we coined that term, the pulmonary trap. Um, and so we saw a pretty, we saw a relief. Uh, Eighty five percent of our patients saw a improvement in their pulmonary function. Uh, they saw a reduction of inflammation. They saw um, really an improvement in their quality of life, at least for a period of time. And it would either stop or slow the progression of their disease. It was a, a really rewarding uh, endeavor for us. Yeah, and you know what I'm finding too is there's different quality of stem cells and different types of stem cells, and it seems so. To get a higher quality, um, a lot of people do end up having to leave the country to go somewhere else and get, you know, from a placenta or from an umbilical cord versus, you know, something that is 
different. Do you find that in your experience, or do you find that there are plenty of doctors here in the U.S. that are still able to get their hands on quality stem cells and be able to help people? Yeah, so I think anyone really has access to get their hands on quality stem cells. Um, the challenge becomes what type of ailments you will treat with that. Um, so typically here in the United States, um, you know, things like arthritis, orthopedic conditions, not a problem, um, hair restoration, those types of things, cosmetic stuff. Um, but when you start to get in some of the more serious conditions, um, it's still encouraged that people, uh, that physicians are overseas largely because some of the FDA, um, kind of regulation around, around what's taking place. Um, that said, we have this master grid of all the different cellular therapy treatment options nationally and internationally. And you kind of break those out into PRP stem cell treatment um, with um, adipose and bone marrow and placental and core blood. And then you've got exosomes and there's a variety of different types of exosomes as well. Exosomes are considered acellular. So there's this whole debate around should they really fall under the FDA regulation or not? Um, and there's a whole discussion there. But I don't necessarily know yet that people really know what makes quality stem cell treatment and what doesn't. Um, some people argue cell count in common sense will make you think, okay, there's more cells, but uh, so therefore it's better. I, I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, I can't speak strongly to that one way or another. I just know that we've worked with scientists who have posed that question. They've said, okay, a billion stem cells versus a hundred million, how much of a difference is it making? And the challenge is there's not necessarily a critical mass of patients enough to draw a statistical correlation to outcomes based on cell count. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also a challenge to see, you know, which one's superior. One thing I do know is that primarily it's, it is a safe procedure. Um, I, I'll say that with some hesitation because I know people out there can argue it. I would just say, I've personally not seen a lot of evidence of serious adverse reactions um, to stem cell treatment, especially if it's your own cells. Um, I know there's gonna be a lot of debate around utilizing other patient cells and I would agree. Um, I don't have enough experience to know the contraindications of utilizing someone else's cells, but I do know that if you're utilizing your own cells that primarily it's been a you know very safe procedure. Yeah. Well, that's been our experience too. It's been pretty interesting. And, and my mom's doing great, which has been a really miraculous thing. Um, so she had originally gotten someone else's stem cells just to kind of, um, kind of kick things off and get things going. And, and they told me to look out for flu-like symptoms in her, but they didn't expect anything too much more serious than that. And then, uh, she's been getting her own, um, you know, monthly, but, uh, it's Ooh. been, it's been a really, um, and, and she feels so much better than she did when she was on low dose or high dose chemotherapy or radiation. So it's, been, and, and consequently it's helped her lung, which, uh, sustained some damage when they did uh, radiation for breast cancer. So, um, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty wild and miraculous. And, yeah. And, you know, I really love what you're doing in terms of testing. I think every person is different and yes, we can make, um, generalizations about what you could or should be eating or taking or doing, but until you really have the data in your hands, um, you don't necessarily know. And it's really hard to get the data. Um, and so, you know, creating these kits and allowing people to test and find out what's going on with them and with their family is really exciting and important. So anything that we are missing in terms of inflammation, autoimmune disease, um, obviously we talked about Alzheimer's, we've not touched on autism, but there's some correlation, you know, there as well, in terms of brain, um, function, anything else that I'm forgetting to ask and think about. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've got maybe a couple notes. Um, you know, you mentioned autism and, um, although I have limited knowledge, um, around the science of what happens from a gut health perspective, Dr. David Perlmutter, I think, pioneered that really that the hypothesis and has done a fantastic job of really helping to simplify it. Um, I love his common sense approach. I mean, it's just simply you, know, you, you can measure all the biomarkers and all that. But he just said, you know, for a set of patients, um, children with autism, we found a way to, to change their diet. Now, I think that what we've done is we've taken his concept and we have further enhanced it because of a specific food prescription that's been put in place. 
And we, um, but he simply said, look, it, it works when you change a kid's diet who has autism um, and you do it properly, you start to see them interact with kids. You know, they're out there playing soccer with friends they may not have done before. You know, they're participating in school. You know, some of the social challenges they may have have had improved. And I mean, that's evidence enough. And what I like about this field that we are in now is it's really hard to argue that taking a um, health test to understand food sensitivity and gut health and providing someone with a with food that they know is healthy for them, it's very difficult to argue that's not going to be good for them one way or another, right? If there's a direct benefit and significantly improving um, one, their likelihood of and or the symptoms associated with an autoimmune disease, um, you know, simple things like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I think MS is being tested under, you know, treatment protocols like this as well. Um, you know, I think those are things that people should research more and to take into consideration, but the reality is I think it's hard to argue that a, a proper diet is not going to be good for you. Um, and the last point is you touched on, and Perlmutter touches on this as well in one of his books, uh, the correlation of gut health directly to, uh, to Alzheimer's and why did they call it diabetes type three? You know, that gut lining gets permeated, causes inflammation, inflammation permeates the blood brain barrier. At some point in time, that brain inflammation causes amyloid plaque buildup, it crystallizes and starts to formulate the, um, you know, the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, and one thing I feel really strongly about, and, um, you know, I'm sure this would, could be somewhat of a controversial comment, but I just really believe that the, that the Alzheimer's associations are headed down the wrong rabbit hole. I mean, there's plenty of drugs and prescriptions out there that can reduce and or eliminate amyloid plaque. And when you do that, you still have Alzheimer's. Um, so sure, it causes Alzheimer's, but my understanding now is once the damage is done, you can get rid of the amyloid plaque and you still have those symptoms. Um, so I think you've got to be able to, sure, perhaps the prescriptions are are one of the legs of the stool, uh, but I think there's some other things like what we're doing here that would really help to improve um, uh, the symptoms associated with Alzheimer's. And my last note is that's that's actually why we got into this. We originally launched the company under the brand, the Cognitive Health and Wellness Institute, geared towards brain health, but we just started to realize there was such a strong correlation to, to a number of other ailments that uh, that we wanted to expand our you know the marketplace. Yeah, thank you for that. And using food as medicine is certainly important. And you know, th there's there's certain things that cause inflammation in us. And and if we can reduce that inflammation, then all of a sudden we're going to start to remove um, a lot of the diseases that we're eventually going to have uh, based on our personal profile um, from that inflammation. So, um, thank you so much, Jimmy. It's really been um, exciting to have you and. Uh, can't wait to help a lot of people with these tests and help them with their diets. So thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me and um, look forward to listening to the show and, and many more, but an awesome show you have here and great company. And uh, thanks for the chance to be on here. Yeah. That's it for this episode of encouraging wellness. We hope this serves as an eye opener to you on new ways to approach your health and wellness. By learning both unique and the best alternative wellness and healing methods, you can live your best life. Listen to more of our episodes at www.hello.health. Be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a rating. Together, let us work towards unlocking you and your family's best self. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one.